All right. What is up, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome. This is a solo show. I'm going to be uh, chopping it up on the notion of playing to lose versus playing to win. Thank you for tuning in. Hit the like button as you come in. It helps me out with the algorithms. So let's get started in this. This could be an hour and a half, two hours that I have enough material to cover, but I can't go anymore in two hours because I have a call then. So some of you have already watched a lot of my content. The Playing to Win podcast series is a concept that I learned several years ago, 2013 or 14. I was at a retreat and our facilitator was talking to each one of us individually about our businesses, about our challenges, hurdles, obstacles, all sorts of stuff. And the notion was introduced several times with many of the participants where our facilitator, Colin, basically said, look, you're a weapon. You're basically a racehorse giving pony rides. Why is this holding you back, right? Like you can play to win in life or you can play not to lose sort of thing. And I'll be honest, I understand that not everybody is built this way. I completely get that. Um, I understand that there's certain people that live this, breathe this, and regardless of where they come from, what their background is, any of those things, it does IQ, it doesn't matter. It's just gumption, just grit, just grunt. Playing not to lose sounds a lot like playing to win, but they are different. And there's different times in life where you're going to play to win and where you're going to play not to lose. When you're a younger guy, it's always playing to win without a question. Don't play defensively. Don't, don't try to just, you know, coast through it. It's, it's a win or nothing else. And you're not going to get them all the time. You're going to fall down. You're going to get beat. You're going to lose. You're going to have scrapes, break, broken bones, all kinds of stuff. I'm going to share a story with you real quick um, about what I just did this weekend. Let me see if I can get it up on the screen here. Uh, there it is. And share. Okay. So this is a picture from Sunday. And I just had my first boxing match, an actual fight. It, it, is, it is a place that you go. You get into a ring. You stand across from somebody else who, in this case, happened to be bigger, younger, had a longer reach. Um, I think he's six foot four, he said. He doesn't look six four in the picture because I'm six two, but he weighs 245. I stepped on a scale that morning at 213, and um, he's 20 years younger than me. And I approached this from a playing to win perspective. I didn't, I didn't set this match. I didn't go to this match. I didn't get up that morning with any other reason or any other intent than to win that match. They say that there is no point in doing things without testing them, without actually putting them to the test, right? They say you can't learn to swim on dry land. Um, the first thought in my mind was lifting weights my entire life and developing a strong physique. And, um, you know, I can pick up heavy shit and put it down. There's no question about that. But then I came to the realization I've never been in a fight. Like I've never been in a real fight where you oppose somebody. Like there's just random shit that happens in school, right? You know, you get in a little scrap with Billy. He pushes you, you push it back, you break his finger. You know, you go to the principal's office, basic stuff like that. I've never been in a real fight. People never really bothered me. Um, you know, when I went out, when I went out with friends, it, it just never really happened. I don't know if we got lucky or it's just because we're all a bunch of big guys that, that, that look big and strong because we worked out or what it was, but I never really got bothered. So my first thought three, four years ago was, okay, I should really learn how to fight. Like, it, you know, if I have this strength, then what's the point of it if you can't apply it? So I started training and training and training. I did about three years. If you guys follow me on Instagram, you've probably seen years now of me doing posts after each training session with the caption dues paid. That was what I would do an hour, sometimes an hour and a half. Some of the sessions were after the session, I would post a receipt and say, dues paid, done it, right? And I think they're all in the highlights somewhere over there. So two to three years into boxing, I get to the point where it's like, okay, I've done this now. I'm, I'm now sparring. I'm sparring against my coach. I'm hitting the bag hard. I'm doing the speed bag. I'm doing all this shit. Shouldn't I test this? Like, shouldn't I get into a match? And, uh, you know, we kind of went back and forth a little bit with it. We finally, like, you have to find an opponent. And surprisingly, it's, you know, my first thought was, well, we should find somebody with my level of experience, about three years, about my age, willing to do the same sort of thing. But surprisingly, that doesn't really exist because most guys that get into boxing do it at a young age. And there's not many guys stupid like I was 
to get at it uh, at my age. Uh, but we found James there in the photograph. James is a um, he's a he's a stunt actor. You know that's that that's his job. He's an ex bouncer. He's ex security. Uh, he's he's a big boy. When he comes at you swinging his arms, I'm not going to lie. It's scary, right? Um, it's one of those things that you have to face when you get in the ring. I got up early that morning. The fight was at nine o'clock. I got up early, uh, did a bit of meditation, listened to a 15 minute Viking war chant, um, did some stretching, you know, uh, ate my meal when my trainer told me to eat my meal, like 90 minutes roughly, you know, before the fight with the right amount of rice, uh, you know, to protein combo, you, you know, like I, I did all the planning leading up to it. My, my trainer gave me this book. Uh, I don't know if you can see it. It's called the custom auto mine. If you don't know who Custom Auto is, he's he was a trainer for uh, Mike Tyson and a few other world class boxers. And one of the things that I I took away from that is you have to approach each fight, each combat, with the understanding, with the mindset that you've trained, you've done the work, you've put in the reps, and that you deserve the win. So I only invited a few people. I had some some of my friends locally, guys in my community, are like, hey, you know, can we come out and check it out? I had people message me when I you know, announced that I was going to do it. You know, can I buy tickets? Can I support this, that, and other thing? It was, it was none of those things. There was only three people that came. Um, a business partner of mine that's kind of tied into what I'm doing, my strength trainer, who I see twice a week, my boxing coach, who was in my corner and also ref the um, uh, match. Uh, and I was on the fence about bringing my girlfriend because I've seen videos online where women have seen their men lose combat in MMA fight or boxing fights, and they never look at them the same. And I was hesitant to make the invite. At first, I didn't extend it. And then on, on the morning of, I said, you know what? Show up there at 9 o'clock. You need to see this because the plan was to win. There was, there, there was no playing the game not to lose. There was no, I'm going to tie it. There was, I'm going to approach this from the perspective of it's got to be a win. It's a win or nothing else. That's what playing the win looks like. I narrowly beat him, okay? I didn't. I didn't come out on an obvious top, knock him out. I don't think James can be knocked out. He's he's like he's hurt his body pretty bad doing all the stunt shit that he does in movies and films. Um, and he's, he's told, I mean, he basically said, "I'm a meat missile." He goes, "Just just just hit me as hard as you can. I'm I'm probably not going to get knocked out." I gave him three good clocks, hooks to the head. The last and final one was after he knocked the wind out of my chest, and I. I basically spun his headgear around almost like it, it got loose and he had to go back in his corner and um, secure it back. So, you know, when you approach life and battles and, and fights, you know, and things like this from the perspective that it's a win or nothing else. I mean, I want to say you can't lose, but here I am today. I'm not that sore. You know, my next little sore, I took a couple jabs to the head didn't take any under under um, uh, hooks, didn't take any uh, shovel punches, didn't take any check hooks, nothing, um, nothing. I, I, I was moving the whole time. Um, so aside from a few pretty heavy jabs, you know, my neck's pretty good. I could be in a lot worse shape today. I don't know what kind of shape James is in. I mean, I'll, I'll probably run into him on uh, Friday and I'll ask him how he's doing. But, you know, the, tip my hat to him for putting his jaw on the line because who the hell knows what would happen. It could have ended badly for me, man. I'm not a young dude, you know. Um, a lot of people said I was crazy. Maybe I am crazy. I don't know. But I had to do it. I said I was going to do it, and I had to do it. So I may or may not do another one. We'll see. I think if I do another one, I want to I want to get somebody that's closer to my uh, age and uh, skill set because that was... Uh, that was like a wow. <laughs> anyway, um, so I wanted to share that story first. It's relevant for a whole bunch of reasons. And in life, playing to win and playing not to lose is is just methodology that you go through all the time. When you get older, like when you've when you've made a large amount of money, you've been successful, you've run some companies, you've you've invested, you've diversified. Then, there, then there's probably a time, and I'm probably at that time for the most part when it comes to events like that, where I play more not to lose. It's it's more on the conservative side. Um, you know, I don't take as big risks anymore when it comes to capital investments or investments or business ideas or any of those things. Um, that's just a piece of advice that I got one, one time. But when you're younger, you can certainly make those mistakes because you've got all this runway in front of you. You know, a 20-year-old is going to live a lot longer than a guy like me. So his risk tolerance level should be higher. 
Now, one of the things that I'm going to be mentioning in this show as well, because I just opened it for enrollment, is the School of Entrepreneurship. And I just opened that up on um, Monday, yesterday. Uh, it's open for enrollment until May the 6th. I've had people ask me about this from time to time with business ideas. You know, how do I learn to become an entrepreneur, business, this, that, and the other thing. And here, let me just see if I can find the community tab because um, there's actually a post I need to kind of review with the comments. It's probably the best way to do it. I did. All right. No, that's not it. Come on, YouTube. Cooperate. There we go. Community. So I did a survey. And here it is. Let's put that up on the screen. Share screen. And so I did the survey two months ago, closer to the start of the year, obviously, because I wanted to get some feedback from people that watch my stuff. And it's 90% guys, like 91.6% dudes watch my stuff, the rest of it's women. Um, so I said, men, what are you putting the most focus on this year? Options were having better frame in my long-term relationship, getting more women, learning what they respond to, losing fat, gaining muscle, being more captivating, and making more money. Making more money, surprisingly, came out at 60%. 60% of you guys that watch my channel, there were 16,000 votes on this. So out of the 16,000 people that voted on this, they said they wanted to make more money. They're not happy with the amount of money that they make. Uh, I think I asked at one point in another survey on the community tab, here it is, um, add to stream, what level of monthly income would you be satisfied with? 32,000 votes on this one. And for the vast majority of people, $25,000 a month was the level of income that they would be satisfied with out of the 32,000 votes. So the reason why I'm showing you this in context is because I'm going to go to the top here of the community tab again. I talked about this last night, but I didn't go through the comments. I think the comments are more telling than anything because it really talks about um, playing to win versus playing not to lose as a whole. Um, so this is just a meme. Must be willing to work in a fast pace and exciting environment. And then it has a picture of the environment, right? This is just ad copy. I wrote this entire thing. I didn't pay anybody to write it. I like to write, you know, from time to time. I wrote my entire book. I'm writing the follow-up book. Um, this is just some copy that I wrote. It's basically a long form sales letter. And I talk about all these elements of life, <clears throat> what we're dealing with today as men. It, well, here, let me just go through the highlights really quick, right? Um, jobs, you know, we're told to go get a job, get a career. The truth, the truth of the matter is, is job is an acronym for just over broke. You're a cog in a wheel of conformity. And I know this because in my twenties, I was that guy. I was a wage slave in an office. Um, Kevin O'Leary said it best, a salary is a drug they give you to get you to forget about your dreams. I've also worked loads and loads of labor intensive jobs. I've planted forests for the Ministry of Natural Resources. I've been an apprentice mechanic in a shop, done brake jobs, oil changes, alignments, tune-ups, all that kind of stuff. I've done lots of stuff, okay? It wasn't until 30 that I hit my stride and leaned more into entrepreneurship. And if I'm being honest, people always ask me the same thing in podcast interviews. If I could go back in time and offer myself some, some different advice that I would listen to, I would say, take greater risks sooner. Basically, become an entrepreneur sooner is what I would tell myself. And I'm not special at all. What is special about me is my mindset. <clears throat> um, I'll talk about that in a minute because I got a few other books over here that I want to reference as well. And there's a there's one page I want to read out of this one as well too. <clears throat> um, anyway, you know, like the, it's the standard thing: you get up, you commute, you go to work, you take your short breaks, you work, you take your lunch, you work, you commute home, you pay your tax, you sleep, you repeat. You're basically a tool, you know, for the system or the matrix, whatever it is that you want to call them. You're trading an hour of time or a day of time or whatever that time frame happens to be, depending on how you compress or stretch it out for the same, for a equivalent amount in compensation. It could be hourly rate, could be a salary, could be whatever, but it's, it's fitting in that same time frame, right? There's only 24 hours in a day. Um, I talk about the facts or the reality about being a millionaire. I mean, if you live in a large urban city, in the West, London, Toronto, Vancouver, New York, Miami, LA, Chicago, any large urban center, 
they usually call them large urban coastal city center sort of things. If you're, if you're worth a million dollars, it, it, it doesn't equal financial freedom. It doesn't equal F you money, right? You can't like, I was worth that when I basically got into a scrap with my VP at the age of 29. And then I found out later on that year that you get let, let go for fit, but you get hired for your resume. You don't have F you money in a scenario where you're worth about a million bucks. You just don't. Um, it's not what it was once thought to be of something of value to to really have f u money in today's world, especially if you live in a large western coast coastal city, you need like ten million bucks, you know, for being honest. There's six sources of income to become absolutely wealthy today. And I've talked about this many times on my channel. I'm going to ex expand on it even more in a book in my follow up. It's and I, I'm not going to go into the details, but one, it's C-suite jobs, CEO, CFO, CTO, that kind of stuff. Licensed professionals, doctors, lawyers, surgeons, accountants, dentists, whatever. High ticket sales, you're selling yachts, jets, mansions, you're getting a percentage of that. Uh, number four is fame with an audience. Um, it's difficult to define, but it's essentially actors, musicians, influencers, people that are creators. You know, I would I would probably distill it down to, and they have people that listen to them or pay attention to what they have to say. When Kim Kardashian says, buy my Spanx brand, women in droves click the button and they go and buy the Spanx brand, right? Um, STEM, software engineers, tech leads, that kind of stuff. I've talked to lots of guys on consults going through the divorce grinder that um, have made seven, $800,000 a year working for companies like Amazon, Facebook, or whatever, just doing Cody stuff, like the geeky stuff. And number six is entrepreneurship, which is basically my chosen path. And I'll tell you more about why, you know, in this video and the relevancy between the playing to win and playing not to lose concepts. Um, let's skip over the part about real estate tools. Now, now here's something that's interesting because a lot of people still get mad at this. And I don't know why, because it should be obvious as daylight to people by now. But the scamdemic was a scam. Every... So one through five on that list there, where I was talking about CEOs, doctors, athletes, musicians, all this stuff, all of these people, actors, doctors, athletes, lawyers, CEOs, they all wore face diapers. They all got jabbed. They all bent the knee. They all use pronouns in their bio when they're asked to by corporate. They all eat the woke rainbows and they follow their agenda because you're still, you're still part of that. You still have to conform. You know, uh, you still have a governing body in regards to what it is that keeps your license on the up and up. Um, society doesn't really want freedom. They want free stuff. So that's what we end up voting for, generally speaking. Okay. And it comes to the, and it, and it comes at a price of yielding to their agenda. Monkey see, monkey do. Don't ask questions. Do as you're told. Stand on your dots. Whatever it happens to be. Whatever the next thing, whatever the next scam happens to be, whatever that's going to look like, whether it's climate lockdowns, whether it's a new variant of some, you know, airborne virus or whatever it happens to be. Ask yourself, how is that working out for you? How did that last one work out for you? You know, did you get where you want? You know how many people messaged me during the last scamdemic? They are telling me that if I don't provide uh, proof that I was vaccinated, then I'm going to lose my job. What, I, what do I do, Rich? I don't want to get this stuff. I haven't seen it tested. I don't think I need it. I'm young and I'm healthy, but I have a roof over my family's head and I have a mortgage to pay. And I have obligations and we're already fighting. So what do I do? And it's like, what do you want me to tell you? This, like this, this is what you created for yourself. These are the choices that you make. And I'm going to tell you right now, it's not entirely your fault, but it is your fault if you allow it to happen again. You know, the whole once bitten, twice shy sort of thing, right? Code of the matrix, anti-fragility. We'll talk about this a little bit more too. <clears throat> do you guys know what anti-fragility is? There's a book called Anti-Fragile, okay? You take, there's three physical states. There's fragile, anti-fragile, and there's robustness. Fragile, you take a, a glass, you drop it, it's going to break. It's fragile. You want to ship that to somebody, you got to put loads of popcorn wrapping and bubble wrap in it and put a big fragile sticker on it. When chaos is introduced to that object, it generally fractures, breaks, and it doesn't respond well to it. You do not want to be fragile as a human being in life. Robustness is, is, is a better place to be. And that's the equivalent of just taking a, a burlap bag and filling it with sand. 
I can ship that to somebody and not put Fragile on the outside of the box. doesn't matter. You drop it, nothing's really going to happen, right? So that's something that would be considered robust. The concept of anti-fragility is something that improves with chaos. I said this you know, the other day. Um, most businesses, most storefronts, most restaurants, um, a, buddy, a, a good buddy of mine owns a gym. He almost got cleaned out in the scamdemic because he couldn't open up to the public. Um, the margins in that suck before that to, to begin with. But a lot of these businesses almost got cleaned out. Some of them did. Guys like Jeff Bezos or Walmart online shopping or Amazon or eBay, for example, did very, very well. That's, that's, that's a concept of anti-fragility. When chaos was introduced to the equation, they improved. I want you to think about that. Where in your life where chaos has been added to your life has been, has been included into the blender of bullshit that you blend up every day in your life because there's all kinds of inputs that you put in this thing, right? Have you, have you found an opportunity to become stronger to improve when chaos is introduced? Most don't, right? You know, like at the end of the day, the government doesn't care about you. Big pharma doesn't care about you. Employers generally don't care about you. Large corporations certainly don't give a shit about you. Hollywood doesn't care about you. But we, and when I say we, we all, you know, as a culture in society, defer to that as the authority and trust. <clears throat> you know, you'd love to have sovereignty as a guy, but you really don't. They want you on their plan, plugged into lives, paying, ta paying taxes, in debt, following the rules, bending the knee to the trending thing that controls the masses, right? One week, it's masculinity is toxic, Gillette razors, right? The next week, it's some guy named Dylan that thinks he's a girl, puts on a dress and does commercials for women's makeup lines or light beer. Now, my take on all of this is the absolute best way to escape it all is to become an entrepreneur and build a business that you can run from anywhere in the world. I'm gonna, sorry, I'm gonna put the ticker up on the bottom. I should have done this at the beginning because I've mentioned the School of Entrepreneurship's open. There is a link in the description. You can click that and start there. It's, it's only open until the end of the week. The problem though is that this playing not to lose mentality, this, this mindset is infused in every faction of life including entrepreneurship. Most people that start a business, within three years, nine out of 10 of them fail. So you've got basically a 10% success rate if you're lucky. And that out of the 10% that succeed after three years of those businesses, very few of them never crack a million dollars in annual sales. They're the mom and pop shops that are you know, opening up a storefront, doing alterations, might have a small hardware shop, a landscaping business, or whatever, a daycare, doggy walking service, any one of these things, right? They never usually crack a million dollars in sales. And what you end up doing is you've ended up, because you've, because you've played not to lose, because you've done the conventional thing that you've always been told to do, you end up in a scenario where now you're an employee of a company that you founded, maybe with one or two other people working there, making about the same money as you would have if you were just an employee at Bob's company. The biggest difference though is you don't have Sorry, you have more headaches than you would have if you worked at Bob's company because Bob deals with all the bullshit. Bob deals with any lawsuits that come in, any labor board you know, issues, any complaints from HR. Bob deals with all that because he's the founder, he's the owner. You just punch a clock and go home. So if you're making the same amount, amount of money as what you would be if you're working for somebody else, that's actually a better position to be. And sure, you get a little bit in the way of write-offs, but you're still paying the same tax levels because you're still on payroll the same way that you would if you were be working for Bob sort of thing, right? So this is a very common mistake that a lot of entrepreneurs make in life when it comes to making choices, the kind of businesses that they run. I've said this before, it's a noble effort, but they've often created a company that employs them and they, and they pay themselves the same, exposed to greater risk that they have to deal with, right? And if the state says, oh, lock everything down for the next scamdemic, you gotta comply. And guess what? You're now the owner of the business at that time, right? Employees were able to go home, collect a government handout check. You know, most of them made out A-OK. -okay. But when they were called back to work, they were called back and they said, OK, well, now you got to take these uh, experimental jabs. 
some people will go to college, they'll go and get their uh, degrees or educations, whatever. And, um, you know, those things can cost tens of thousands of dollars a year in books, tuition, you know, if you're staying on, on campus and that sort of stuff. And you're basically taught again by tools of the matrix, right? Like I've often said, I'm not a big fan of post-secondary education when you get into colleges and universities and stuff like that, because most, most of them today anyway, have a lot of wokeness infused in the, in the culture. There's far more women in universities and colleges today than there are men. Um, there would have been a time where that would have been like a good thing. But now with Me Too's and false accusations and like the woke narrative and the rainbows that want to cram down your throat, um, unless you're in a field or an area like STEM, for example, or a degree that's going to give you the right to practice law or become a surgeon, for example, they really don't add up. They don't make a lot of sense, right? That's the whole point on why I created the School of Entrepreneurship. Okay. It is, it is, it is a distilled version of everything that I've learned over the last 26 odd years when it comes to anything to do with running a profitable business that you can run from anywhere in the world and it's easy and fun, right? Um, there's three circles. Let me see. Here it is. Come on. I usually pull these up and put them back on. There's three interlacing circles. A lot of people have asked me about this and I need to keep this handy for you. See if the camera will focus. You see that? When those three things overlap in business, you love doing it, you're good at it, and it makes money. That centerpiece, that, that gold part, is where the magic happens. It's all it boils down to. Anyway, so this course that I created really just, you know, it offers more information on the best way to handle these things, how to structure business. And I can get into all the details in a minute, but that was the post from yesterday. Now, the reason why I've read all this to you and I've given you this, this little spiel, shown you this meme, is because all of the responses from people, this is a funny post from the other day, <laughs> blew up on Twitter. Um, all, a lot of the responses from people were very, very divided in two different camps. And you can go see this right now. You go click through and check it out afterwards if you want. But they're divided in two camps. There's the guys that are like, I needed this message. Thank you for stating this. Um, I saw it, but I didn't see it. Like some version of that, right? Massive gratitude to you don't get it. You're you're not in touch with reality, right? So let's so let's go through these because this is definitely a playing to win versus playing not to lose concept. Um, let's sort by top comments. I think uh, so. This one here was a positive piece of feedback. I don't know if you guys can read this. Should I make this bigger? Anyway. I think you isolated this one down to general concern your audience very well. This spoke to me. Well done. Okay, so it made sense of this guy. Uh, we've got a guy here that's a brick and mason layer at 23, working for himself for a year now, but working for a few guys when I was younger, helped him learn much more and acquire real skills and make contacts in the construction to make good money. Everyone starts somewhere. Nothing wrong with a wage job. Now, I didn't say there was anything wrong with a wage job. So this fellow takes it immediately like I'm disparaging you. If we didn't have brick and mason workers, we wouldn't have buildings. We wouldn't be able to maintain buildings. We wouldn't have beautiful architecture. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying, though, is if you're in a position like this, it is a more difficult business to run than one that could be location independent or run from anywhere in the world with better margins. What do brick block mason lay layers need to do? Well, let's take a look at it for a second. You need heavy equipment. Uh, I know a I know a guy very very intimately well that's 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 a uh, masonry guy, and here's the here's the complaints that I hear from him when it comes to his business. People don't show up on time. They're lazy. They're incompetent. Sometimes they show up to work stoned or high. Um, there was one time where one of his incompetent workers was using a forklift to move some mortar around and then flipped it. Right. That that didn't become his worker's problem. It became his problem. He had to get the thing upright. There was an insurance claim. There was damage to the motor because things flooded in different areas. There's all kinds of things that, that happen with this, right? These are the sorts of things that happen when you play in an arena that is playing not to lose. Because you know for decades, for hundreds, for thousands of years, there's always been brick block mason layers. Brick block mason is what he called it anyway. So that's fine, right? And there's nothing wrong with that. But are you playing to win? Maybe that's his version of playing to win, right? At 23, that might have been my version of playing to win, being self-employed, you know, working for myself for a year. But I'm a lot older now. I've seen a lot more. 
And I know as a fact of reality, based on my experiences in life, that playing to win does not at all reflect that, that definition. Anyway, but that's what you'll get, right? Uh, everyone's different. I wouldn't have the courage to run my business successfully today if it wasn't for all the skills, experience, hardship, and pain I got from working with all these corporate jobs. The pain built character gave me purpose and forced me to perform at a higher level better than I ever did in my entire life. It's a great point. Um, being successful, this is another positive point. Grizzly Adams. Do this guy was talking about the concept of anti fragility. Glad that I mentioned it. Oh, here's a guy. Okay, so. Hey, Rich, I work for an entrepreneur, a man, a lot like you. I enjoy working for him. And while I do do work in a fast paced environment with intensity and long hours, I really enjoy what I do and helping build up a terrific company. That's great. I was I was at that point for several years in my debt settlement business, and uh, we had great company culture, loyal staff. It was a lot of work, but um, a lot of people were like this guy as he's talking about. Anyway, I suppose you don't tell your employees that they just have a job, do you? No, it's it's a new concept that I've come to re realize in the last few years. When I was running that business, I didn't even look at that concept. Only about 5 to 10% of us are cut out to be entrepreneurs. Really? Because if you go back about a thousand years, everybody was an entrepreneur. Right? They didn't have to put pronouns in their bio. They didn't have to pay taxes at the levels that are being paid. They didn't have to take uh, experimental jabs. None of those things. Right. Everybody was basically self-employed and, and could play to win in their life in any direction that they want. Anyway, so the playing not to lose concept is the whole only about five to 10 percent of us are cut out to be entrepreneurs. If I believe that. At a younger age in my 20s, I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you guys today. I wouldn't have. This best selling book getting close to a million copies. I wouldn't have the audiences that I have. I wouldn't have the plaques on the wall over there from the subscriber count that I have on the different channels. I wouldn't have the investment portfolio. I wouldn't have anything if I believe that. If I believe that only a small percentage of people can achieve greatness, then you're basically starting from a, from a loss position. That's playing not to lose. Now, that's a mindset that you can adopt. But my question always then goes to how is that working out for you. Just scrolling through a few of these over here because there's some good ones. I should have highlighted them with hearts before. Uh, this guy said I couldn't have put it any better. The sad reality is most of society has been programmed to believe. Thank you for contributing. Okay. Tomorrow. Wow, Rich, enjoyed your insights, extremely intelligent thoughts. Okay. There's a, there's a few more haters in here somewhere. Let me see if I can find some of them, the plain not to lose guys. No. Here's one. I'll never be a millionaire and I don't really care. Hang on, let me know later there. I'll never be a millionaire and I don't really care. I'm in STEM making good money and I'm content. Being an entrepreneur isn't something that I want to be. I like what I do and I feel fortunate and that's fine, right? But you're not playing to win. You're playing not to lose, right? So when you do that and then the next time they say you have to take this experimental jab or you have to do this new woke narrative to make other people feel comfortable, you're going to have to comply. I don't have to do any of those things ever. I never will. It's never going to happen, right? Because I play to win in life in that realm there's different realms in life right dang it rich every time you open it every well very well written fantastic post um there's a few of them here why didn't they pop up at the top i guess people didn't like them because they didn't like them right uh this guy over here says so this is another play not to lose comment right i have a decent wage managing a lab laboratory as a chemist but I'm still under the boot of my company. I know I'm capable of doing a lot more, capitalized a lot, more specifically in the area of product development. Got the whole lab to myself, right? So, so I mean, you, you will come to realize that there is a limitation, there's a glass ceiling that you cannot break through when you have a J-O-B. Best post so far, Rich, solid pitch. 
Uh, taking EMS classes in the fall, says Hunter. EMS, I think that's emergency medical services, if I'm not mistaken. No, I won't make nine figures in my line of work, but at least I'll have practical skills that are priceless and won't be a drone. Do you think so? What happens when you have to provide medical assistance to somebody who's clearly a man but says that they're a woman? You know, there's there's lots of things to contemplate in different lines of work. And if freedom and if playing to win is important to you and if money, wealth, like, you know, when people took the survey uh, a couple of months ago and 60% said they want to make more money. And then when I asked them a few months prior to that, how much money would you like to make monthly? And it, the vast majority said $25,000 a month. There's nothing in here so far that I've seen in bricklaying, masonry, EMS, or any of those things that's going to net you anywhere close to $25,000 a month. There's only fans. Look, if you're a girl and you're even average looking or slightly better than average looking, you can open up an OnlyFans and you can do that. You can make $25,000 a month as a chick, right? It comes at a cost though. <laughs> you're, never, you're probably not going to find a top shelf guy to invite you into your life and start a family with them and have children. Um, here's another one, Athena. I guess this is a woman. So Athena says, uh, I'm not sure about this one. Entrepreneurship isn't for everyone. I, I totally agree. Most people fail a few times before succeeding. Actually, it's not a few times. It's about 90%. I went into STEM, into a STEM major, so science, technology, engineering, maths, and am at a Canadian government agency job earning $100,000 a year. I'm shocking, right? You know, the federal government pays $100,000 a year. Really laid back environment. Shocking, right? Work from home three days a week. Again, shocking. Most days, I barely do three to four hours a day. Ooh, a government worker that only works three to four hours a day. Proud of you, ma'am or man or whatever. There weren't any layoffs. Many colleagues have been around here for more than 30 years. I doubt I'll do better in any other situation. I've often said that women play not to lose a lot more than men. This is a classic example of cope, right? Again, I'm not saying become an entrepreneur. I am offering a course in entrepreneurship that is open for enrollment. Link in the description below. Again, shameless plug. But I'm not saying it's for everybody. I'm saying it is the path that I've chosen. I've looked at other paths. I know how you can make lots of money. I know how you can get freedom. I know how you can play to win. And I know the difference between playing to win and playing not to lose. And this comment here from Athena is absolutely playing not to lose. Secure government job, makes $100,000 a year, won't ever be laid off. People around her have been there for 30 years and she only needs to work three to four hours a day. This is what the enormous amounts of tax money that I pay into the government system goes to. Three to four hours a day of work from home, most days during the week with her degree. I don't know what she does. Oh, here's one. Exactly. This is a sarcastic one. Oh, hang on. Go back. Oh. Anyway, this guy Beasley said uh, exactly all 8 billion people on earth are going to be entrepreneurs. On earth should be entrepreneurs. Makes perfect sense to me. This is, these are just the sarcastic dipshits that it's it's a lot easier to just say blah, 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 blah than to actually do any work. Uh, can I share this? Yeah, you can share these anywhere you want. I'm not, I'm not sure why you'd ask these questions. Cubicles these days are smaller, far less private. I've been self-employed, been through the ringer. It's okay to take a job to reset and regroup before you're off again. My only goal right now, so this guy says, my only goal right now is $10,000 a month. Once I achieve that, I can expand because I have a lot of money to use for my business. Why set the bar so low, right? I mean... Uh, Raising your standards is the easiest way to change the outcomes in your life. You want to invite better women into your life, raise your standards for the kind of women that you date. You want to have better health, raise your standards for what you eat and how you train, right? Uh, here's a balanced, maybe slightly negative playing not to lose from Kyle. Um, he says, I have no problem being a very expensive cog in the wheel as a physician. So this guy's a doctor. Uh, number three on the list, right? licensed professionals, doctors, lawyers, accountants, that sort of stuff. I'll never make less than $250 an hour. Well, $250 an hour if you live in like Thailand or Vietnam is pretty good. But it, like in Toronto or New York, it's not 
it's not great. Like it's not going to afford you a great life. I can move a- anytime, anywhere I want with no anchors other than family needs. I have plenty of free time for any number of side hustles and hobbies. If you're going to sell your time to somebody uh, else as a commodity, there's nothing wrong with that. Just know that uh, you have to make it such that your time is too valuable for them not to fairly compensate you. Also remember that once you build your reputation in many cog positions above, you can be highly valuable contractor under your own direction as ad hoc 1099 employee. So basically contractor, right? So again, that's that's a playing not to lose angle, right? Um, how many jabs did this guy take? How many other requirements and hoops does he have to uh, jump through to comply with Western regulations and medical health care? I know some doctors. I know a, a doctor right now that I could pick up the phone and call and he would answer right away if he saw my name that owns multiple ER centers, right? Um, they're, they're well aware of a lot of the problems. And if you ask him the question, he doesn't say that he's a physician or a doctor. If you ask him, are you a doctor or are you an entrepreneur? He's an entrepreneur with a physician's license that runs medical centers, right? So, you know, there's, there's a big difference between $250 an hour that this guy makes and probably $3,000 an hour that my friend makes because he's a, a entrepreneur that also happens to be a physician that runs medical centers. You see the difference, right? Like there's, there's a big difference between like this is a, this Kyle is a playing not to lose angle and my friend is a playing to win angle, right? So two different things. Anyway, there's a whole bunch more through here. Again, like I said, they were they were mostly split. You know, some of them were very very positive. This really spoke to me. It rang true. You know, bought your course, whatever. And then there's a good chunk of them were like, you're disconnected. <laughs> Fine. A um, couple more resources, and I'll tell you what. If you guys have any questions about entrepreneurship, um, I will. Let me invite copy. I'll, I'll get to that super chat in a second. Um, call in and only on the topic though. Okay. We'll drop that in the live chat. Um, I got some resources I want to cover with you here. Uh, Marco said, is the school of entrepreneurship purchasable with crypto or is that off the table? I was signed in on two emails and didn't get any updates in the course. So I emailed my list on Monday. Actually, I emailed it two days before Monday and said, course opens on Monday, have your crypto ready for the discount because I was offering 500 bucks off. I emailed the list that morning and I said, here's how you make the payment, 24 hours from the time date stamp and then it expires. Marco, if you want to email me at entrepreneursandcars at gmail.com, uh, I'll, I'll do you the crypto thing manually, right? So just email me, it's $500 off, the course is 1997. If you want to pay me with crypto, shoot me an email <clears throat> and, I'll, and I'll let you have it, okay? Uh, thanks for asking, though. All right. So what else can I cover here? Need some water. I know that a lot of people listen to influencers today online. And um, I try to mimic them. You can you can guess, you know, some of the people that I'm talking about. When I was a kid, and when I say kid, I mean like 19 to 23 or so. When I was a lot younger, the kind of stuff that I would pay attention to was uh, Bob Proctor and Brian Tracy primarily. I was never on the um, Tony Robbins wagon. He always kind of rubbed me a little bit the wrong way. Um, Brian Tracy wrote a book called Maximum Achievement. This is one of my favorite books of all time. I definitely recommend it if you ever feel like you're not reaching your full potential. Uh, if you look around at your life, your job, what you do, what courses you're taking in school, maybe even, and you have a strong suspicion that you'll be playing not to lose in your life. It's a good book. Very good book. It's old. It's old as shit. My, <laughs> the paper's starting to brown now. I don't even know how old Brian Tracy is or even if he's still alive, but it is a great book. It's, it's, it's one of the few first that really changed the bar. The other one that I would recommend, and I don't even know, I'm sure you can find this on YouTube somewhere in audio format, but Brian Tracy was a very significant personality in my youth. My dad gave me a bunch of audio cassettes before they moved to England. Um, so my parents decided when I was around, I think, 
18 or 19. My dad just got fed up with Canada, the cold winters, the tax rates, the jobs. Uh, we moved here when I was about three, when I was small in the 70s. And um, they've been here pretty much their entire life. They went back to England when I was about 18 or 19. My dad said, screw it, I'm out. I'm done. I'm done with this bullshit. And he, and he went over to England looking for a job. My mom's job was to sell the house. And then, you know, everybody moved over there after that. Um, before he moved there, I had the choice of going there, which I tested for three months and I didn't like, so I came back. He, he, he basically said, look, you know, if you're going to stay here, like this is it, like you're a man now. Okay. Um, there was very few things that I got from him, but, but the most prized thing that I got was a bunch of audio cassettes with a man's name, uh, by the name of Bob Proctor on it. And he was just a motivational speaker it is probably the best way that I could put it. And a lot of people, you know, you'll see it in the comments of that, of that thread, playing to win versus playing not to lose. A lot of people default to play not to lose. Go to what's easy, get a J-O-B, get up, go to work, put in your time, collect your check, invest a little bit of money, go out and drink some beer on Friday nights, Tuesday nights, wing night, you get half price wings. You know, you do all that stuff. I get it. But listening to those audio cassettes that my dad listened to, my dad would never became a successful entrepreneur. He tried a couple of times, but he never did it. And then listening to the tapes and then coming up with these notions that your mind's eye, which is how you see yourself, is the most critical thing to improve. I wish I had a book to recommend, but I'm sure there's going to be YouTube videos. Just search for Bob Proctor cassette tapes or Bob Proctor motivational uh, speaking or any of those things. Um, your mind's eye is going to determine your limits in life. Um, you know, it's like the guys that say, oh, well, you know, there's 8 billion people on earth. So we're all just going to be entrepreneurs like you, Rich. That's not what I said, dipshit. That's not what I said at all. Did you read it? Go back and read it, right? You set those limiting beliefs for yourself. I'm just content. Everything's fine. Is it? Because how many people were complaining during the last scamdemic to me, but did nothing about it afterwards? Playing to win versus playing not to lose. The concept that I kept going back to over and over again is if you think you're a loser and you believe you're a loser, then you will be a loser. If you think that you're an employee and you all you can ever be is an employee, then you will be an employee, right? But when you start believing that you're deserving of more than that, that you're destined for greater things, that's when you open up the scope and the skies then become the limit. And then you look around beyond those limitations because we all draw boxes around ourselves, you know? Um, Steve Jobs, it was often said that, um, you know, there's there's in the box thinking, there's outside of the box thinking, and then there's not even seeing the box thinking. Steve Jobs, founder of Apple, was the man that was not even seeing the box kind of thinking, right? But most people think in the box. Most people play not to lose. They don't play to win. Playing to win is when you start thinking outside of the box. When you don't even see the box anymore, now you're a god. Now you're a legend, right? Especially if you've got the successes and the tools and the resources and the financial capacity behind you. Now you're in legendary territory. But it's it's the meatball between your ears that limits your success in your life. So I was scrolling through social the other day and I saw an old Bob Proctor video. And he was asked in the video, what are your top three books of all time? It's an older video. It's probably at least 20 years old, maybe even 30 years old. And he said, this book, this book. And then he said, U Squared by Price Pritchard. I got the book here. It's not even a book. It's a pamphlet. I bought it off Amazon two weeks ago. Because this is who I am, right? Like, I don't stop. There's no stopping with me. It's not like, oh, I've done that now. I'm just going to go to sleep and take a nap. It's like, oh, there's something that I haven't looked at yet. Anyway, it's not a long book. Like I said, it's basically a, a pamphlet. It's called U Squared. Price Pritchard was one of his good friends. And um, well, here, let me read you two captions from this book. One of them I posted on social media the other day when I was doing the IV. Um, it's the one with the, I promise, are you ready for this right now? It's the one with a fly. Here it is, a true story. So he says, I'm sitting in a quiet room at the Millcroft Inn, a peaceful little place hidden back amongst the pine trees about an hour out of Toronto. 
It's just past noon, late July, and I'm listening to the desperate sounds of a life or death struggle going on a few feet away. There's a small fly burning out the last of its short life energies in a futile attempt to fly through the glass of the window pane. The whining wings tell the poignant story of the fly strategy, try harder, but it's not working. The frenzied effort offers no hope for survival. Ironically, the struggle is part of the trap. It is impossible for the fly to try hard enough to succeed at breaking through the glass. Nevertheless, this little ins insect has staked its life on reaching its goal through raw effort and determination. The fly is doomed. It will die there on the windowsill. Across the room, 10 steps away, the door is open. 10 seconds of flying time, and the small creature could reach the outside world it seeks. With only a fraction of the effort now being wasted, it could be free of this self-imposed trap. The breakthrough possibility is there. It would be so easy. Why doesn't the fly try another approach, something dramatically different? How did it get so locked in the idea that this particular route and determined effort offer the most promise for success? What logic, sorry, what logic is there in continuing until death to seek a breakthrough with more of the same? No doubt this approach makes sense to the fly. Regrettably, it's an idea that will kill. Trying harder isn't necessarily the solution to achieving more. It may not offer any real promise for getting what you want out of life. Sometimes, in fact, it's a big part of the problem. If you stake your hopes on the breakthrough on trying harder than ever, you may kill your chances for success. That's just the intro to the book. There's another quick chapter. It's a page and a half long. Stick with me. The title of this one is Suspend Disbelief. There's a little caption under here that says, if you must doubt something, doubt your limits. So it opens and says, act as if your success is for certain. Did you ever see um, Boiler Room? I think it was Boiler Room. Great movie. You should go check it out. Act as if, right? Um, there's a speech there that Ben, Affle ben Affleck gives. And you can probably just go to YouTube right now and, and search for Ben Affleck's speech, uh, Boiler Room, and you'll see what I'm talking about. I can't play it because he swears through the whole thing. Um, anyway, act as if your success is for certain. Instead of holding back because you don't have hard proof that you can make a quantum leap, see if you end up with evidence proving you can't. Just make the jump. Act as if your success is guaranteed. And then see which set of ideas you should believe in. Your mindset for the moment may be flawed by doubt and skepticism. The idea of making a quantum leap in your performance, jumping from your present level of achievement to one several stages higher in one bold stroke is an alien idea. You haven't been trained to think that way. It's true. You know, th this is an old ass book and it's basically talking about the way the matrix has lied to you, right? You may have to define reservations about the possibility that you can make such exponential improvement at all, particularly with less effort and in a very abbreviated time frame. The experts generally agree, though, that people typically use only about 10% of their true potential. This is absolutely true. If we accept that argument, and even if there were no other resources outside yourself that you could bring to bear on the situation, you still could do 10 times as well as you've been doing. It's the same story with the guys that are just like, I'm just content. I'm just content. And that's fine. You can be just content. Your skepticism, which will presume, sorry, which you presume is based on rational thinking and an objective assessment of factual data about yourself is rooted in mental junk. Your doubts are not the product of accurate thinking, but habitual thinking. Years of you accepted flawed conclusions as correct begin to live your life as if it was, sorry, as if it, as if those warped ideas about your potential were true and, and cease the bold experiment in living that brought you many breakthrough behaviors as a child. Now it's time for you to find that faith that you had in yourself before. If you want to be skeptical of some ideas that truly deserve to be called into question, challenge the thoughts and beliefs that you have argued against, you're taking the quantum leap. Put those old inhibiting ideas to the test by going for it with everything you've got. Right now, just suspend disbelief. I can't do it. It's too hard. Da, da, da. Whatever the reason happens to be. I hear it all the time. You don't have to be convinced that you can succeed and make it a quantum leap. 
but don't keep on believing in those old ideas you've been carrying around with your personal limits. If it will make it easier, hold off for a while on believing anything. Just act like you have complete faith. Merely do what you do if you knew you were going to succeed. This is how I approach my fight. I'm up against an opponent that's 20 years younger than me, that's taller than me, that weighs more than me, and I approach it from the angle of I will win. Behave like you have that total conviction. Doubt is what does the most damage. So don't give it any mental space. Proceed boldly as if it completely, sorry, as if it is completely inconceivable that you will experience anything other than a successful quantum leap. If you must doubt something, doubt your limits. Anyway, it's a very short book. You can get it off Amazon. They're expensive. I think it's 20 bucks, but they're worth keeping around. Let's see if we have time for some call-ins. I have a little bit of time. There's some people waiting. Make sure it's on point and on the topic tonight, guys, today uh, even. Um, if you're interested in the School of Entrepreneurship and you're watching this somewhere else on Twitter, Twitch, or whatever, head over to YouTube. It's in the description. Uh, if you're on Twitter, you can go to my bio, click it. There's you scroll down to the bottom. It says courses. Same thing on Facebook. It's in the description for those of you that are asking. Um, throw this in here. Let's see what we got. Private chat. What do you guys got for me? Uh, let's give it to Dave from the UK first here. All right, Dave, what do you got for me, buddy? Yeah, can you hear me? Your question yeah yeah so the so um at the moment i am um, i'm an accountant so i recently became chartered in february and uh, obviously it takes a while to become chartered so i'm acca chartered if that if that makes any sense and okay. i just don't know what else to do so i have a few ideas in terms of so i'm moving in with my friend we're going to um tackle some businesses together and obviously, mm -hmm. um, you uh, roll us on the red pill guys have uh, shown me the way and how to be uh, successful and how to how to try and progress in my life. It's just obviously I've gotten to this milestone. Um, obviously, I'm 26, so I'm a lot further ahead. I earn a lot more than my um, peers. It's just taking that next step and getting out of the cookie cutter myself i'm doing well right now obviously for my age but mm -hmm. i can do more how old are you i'm 26 and what do you get paid doing what you're doing there in the uk so i currently work uh, i work for the government hence why no face but yeah. um i get paid forty three thousand, which doesn't sound like a lot but i have a cousin that lives in canada and it sort of works out to about seventy thousand a year roughly yeah. CAD. Yeah. Um, what's the earning potential in that in that role? Like, if you stay there for thirty years, as an accountant. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I first came across your content in like twenty twenty. So, I've been quite aggressive in getting pay increases. So I think I went from like eighteen thousand mm -hmm. in twenty twenty to forty three mm -hmm. in the space of three years. So I'm not one to uh, stay at a role for more than a year or two years. Mm -hmm. And that's how I've gotten a pay rise so much. But it's, it's good. Obviously, I've, I've gotten, I've, <clears throat> I've progressed well. It's just, I know I can do more. I'm desperate okay. for more. So. so what's the plan? So what does more look like for you? So I have a few ideas with my friend where the, the, the general gist is we're going to raise some capital in however we can, whether mm -hmm. it be he's really good with cars now I, I, I know a little bit about cars but not as much as him we put our money together and then we look at um reinvesting that some way making our money work for us um i need to read more obviously while you're studying for these accounting is accountancy exams they're quite heavy the exams are quite long so it's difficult to read and i've not been reading the past three years but i'm trying to get back into that now um, so okay so what so what's the business like what does this car business that you're looking at like what does it solve like what's the problem that it tackles so it's it's it doesn't really tackle any problem is uh, my friend is just really good at really good at selling cars and i'm i'm really good at finance um i'm really good at budget forecasting it's not okay. it's not a 
make us it's not going to make us a million pounds but mm. it will make us enough to where we can then um bounce into the next idea so why not aim for a million pounds like why why go for something that's that's going to take all the effort to make less than a million pounds because we don't between us we don't have an idea that will make us a million pounds well, uh, okay and why do you need him then because he sells cars and you're good with finance why do i need him yeah i need him well, i don't this is, I, I don't necessarily need him but he is someone that is a like-minded individual when it comes to business yeah. um so, so a lot of the stuff that you're that you're laying on me here is topics and points that i hit on in my course the school of entrepreneurship and i'll go through the modules after i'm done with the caller so you guys can see what they are um, for those that are curious but a lot of businesses that you start they don't really need financing a lot of the businesses that you start you probably don't need a partner um, there's there's several consequences and downstream uh, deleterious issues that come with having partnerships and taking on financing and the other thing too is why only why only look at something that can barely hit a million pounds in annual sales right the amount of work that you have to put into something that's going to make you half a million versus two million is generally the same it's just you're structuring the business in in such a way that it's scalable and that it can become a real business that is also sellable right um because i mean what's the point in building it is my approach right like there's 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 a notion of an easy business that's fun to operate and it's lucrative and then there's a notion of a hard business that's annoying it's frustrating and it's lame there's acronyms for this by the way joe polish put this together decades ago in his i love marketing podcast it's a great podcast series you can check it out there still elf stands for easy lucrative fun type of business you're talking about a half business right and that's what most people default to it's the, you know it's a whole playing not to lose well, I know about cars. I have a friend that knows about cars. I'm really good with finance. So if we get together, get a little bit of funding, buy a few cars, then we'll have something that we can package out there. And I hate to tell you, my friend, but it's a playing not to lose angle. Okay. Okay. I'm not yes. saying that it won't make money. I don't, I'm not saying that you can't make more money than what you're making right now. You probably will. But if you're 26, know that you have a limited time span ahead of you we all die one day you know it's factual so why burn through several years building something that requires borrowed money with a partnership that's not even going to make a million dollars a year in, in sales but see see these are the things that i talk about when i say think bigger like if you're thinking anyway why not think bigger like a lot of the lectures that i put out in my school of entrepreneurship when i'm going and there's and there's like eight or nine hours of this stuff now a lot of the stuff that i'm talking about is think bigger Right. And this is like the conventional standardized thinking that most people approach creating a business with is I've got accounting skills. I know my earning potential is limited. It's a government. It's not for me. I want I know that I'm destined for more, but it's like the more that you sort of set for yourself instead of instead of moving from crawling to walking to running, you're just moving from crawling to rapid crawling sort of thing like take take bigger take bigger risk especially at 26 you've got lots of life ahead of you man you can you can afford to make a mistake for a year and not be too worried about it right yeah yeah so i am familiar with the the elf and half i kind of i suspected it was a half business it's yeah. just um it's just so the 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 idea was we would obviously live together we'd obviously um while while he while we're doing this so the idea isn't just to be satisfied with this car idea is to be together and come up with strong stronger ideas where we yeah. can actually... and I'll and I'll tell you something man like look yeah. I was in the same boat as you exactly the same boat uh okay. I got I got let go at 30 I had a mortgage to pay on my house my best friend at the time just broke up with his girlfriend he was living with a single mom I got a phone call from his mom and she said you got to help him out it's going downhill real fast bitch is crazy you know help him move you know put him in your house whatever you can do rich help him out i'm like okay fine i moved this guy into my house he was you know he was my best friend i had known him for a long time we've done a lot together we used to ride motorcycles and rip it up 
I brought it into my business because I thought, oh, it would be cool to work with my best friend and live together sort of thing. You, how that rolled out over the next several years is he double crossed me. He found ways to steal contracts. Uh, he colluded with other people and other vendors that we were working with to set up a competitive business, which all, by the way, flopped. It all didn't work out for any of them. And we don't talk anymore, right? Um, I don't have patience for anybody that's going to double cross me. I expect my friendships to have my back, not find ways to try to fuck me over, especially after I save you from a psychopath single mom, right? But these are the sorts of things that you learn over time. And this isn't a unique or a new story. I know there's going to be people in the comments right now, or there's going to be people um, that are going to leave a comment after the video. They're going to be like, this is what happens, you know, when you when you bring friendships into a business. It's very, very rare that friendships and partnerships succeed in that sense. It's only when you bring complementary skill sets to the table that they have a strong propensity for success. So there's this notion of the inside guy and the outside guy. Um, it's been talked about several times. I'm not sure if you've heard about it, but a good example is Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak, right? Steve Wozniak was the inside guy. He developed the hardware, the software, built all the shit. He was a geeky guy, right? Um, I was fortunate enough to meet this guy about 12 years ago. Cool, cool dude. Um, Jobs was the outside guy. He was the face of the marketing. He was the face of the company. He was a go, go, go guy. He was a, you know, he was a leader of the business sort of thing from that sense. When you have complementary skill sets and you are driven towards in the same direction and look, living together, being friends, I'm not saying it's, it's absolutely 100% not going to work out, but the worst place to start from is, well, we're friends and we're going to live together. And we're going to tackle this because we both have the same interests. You will find very, very quickly that as soon as money starts to roll in, the dynamic of your friendship will change very rapidly. Okay. So you uh, have to be very, very careful with inviting a friend into a startup idea that you have. The best ones, honestly, do every single guy that has the exact same story that I just told you or a version of the exact same story that I told you. And I've heard this dozens and dozens of times because I've done retreats here, there, everywhere all over the world. And when you sit down and you have the fireside chats and you start talking about something like this, you're surprised. Like 80% of entrepreneurs have a story very, very similar to this, where they invited a friend into a business because they thought it would be cool because they never run one before and you're a little bit scared and you think it might be cool to do it with a friend because you can win together. As soon as things start to grow and money rolls in, they find ways to manufacture indignation and point at you. And that's when things start to go sideways. 80%. 80% of the time, this is where things go. So just be very, very careful with the whole friend angle. You know, I, I, I'd invite you to marry on that a little bit more. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, I think, I think obviously, I, I, the only reason I'm considering it, because, um, again, I've known him for a long time. He's, uh, we have the same views when it comes to women. Like, um, we have the same views when it comes to uh, business and life and, and when, same story that I got with my best friend, dude. Yeah. <laughs> my yeah. ex-best friend now. And by the way, he reached out to me afterwards and he said, hey, man, you know, can we just forget about all this? I was like, no, you're a ghost. Yeah. Lose my number. It's done. You don't fuck me over and expect me to become your friend again. Yeah. It's right? just uh, it's just my friend. He, like, he wouldn't he wouldn't get with a single mother. Like He might do something else. That's true. That is true. I of course, like. I will always have my one eye on him, but at the end of the day, um, if Dave, let me, yeah. let me just leave it on this note and point. Uh, the, the school of entrepreneurship is open for enrollment. Have you bought the course? No, I've not. The course includes nine hours of lectures. Almost. There's a lot of useful webinars after that. There's monthly zoom calls that you can pop in and ask questions anytime you want, by the way, you can do it month one. You can do it month 17. If you want, doesn't matter. Right. And then there's a private Facebook community where you can chop up ideas with the other guys in the community. Why not just buy the course, indulge yourself in it, and then see what you can create out of it? Okay. That sounds good. Contemplate it. Yeah. I think Thanks, Dave. All right. Thank you. See you, bud. Take care. And the link for that, again, is in the description of the YouTube video. Mike says, as an entrepreneur, I got sued by a loser that has no case. Fun, fun, fun. Yeah, look, that's that's one of the things that will happen when you get involved in businesses lawsuits. Um, if you live in the States, you're probably going to deal with more of them than you normally will. I've seen several of them in my time. The first one bugs you a little bit. Um, 
But after you've been through it once or twice, you, you don't lose any sleep. It's just like, okay, another dipshit that thinks that they're going to win something. And for the most part, they don't really uh, like one of the best pieces of advice. Like one of the things that I can tell you that's in the course material is the vast majority of legal notices that you'll get written on a legal letterhead trying to convince you to stop doing what you're doing. Cause that's what it boils down to. You're doing something that they don't like and they want you to stop. And it usually comes with a veiled threat. Unless that notice from the lawyer comes with a statement of claim attached, which is, I mean, that's what they call it here, but it's essentially a registered legal document with a, with a court clerk stamp on it, meaning that they've paid the money, they've ponied up, they put their money where their mouth is, and they're serious about doing something to change the course of what you're doing in your business legally. Unless it comes with that, you can basically run it through the shredder or you can use it as toilet paper. Because four out of five times, from my experience, that's exactly what it's useful for. Anybody that's serious, and this came from a business partner that I have that's still involved in one of my businesses. He's a lawyer. Anybody that's serious registers a claim. They don't write you know, frivolous letters back and forth. That's weak. It's some beta ass shit. And you can literally use it as toilet paper. Not legal advice, but that's one of the things that I talk about in my course when it comes to legal stuff. Um, Chris Amy, thank you for the kind words. Uh, on a final thought before rolling, buy Rich's School of Entrepreneurship course, great value. He should be asking a hundred times at least for the price to enter. Uh, Chris got in early. He's been in it for a while and, uh, you know, guy that runs his own thing. So, you know, there's little uh, testimonial if you need it. Uh, let me go to the private chat here and see who else we got. Zach here. I'll give Zach a shot here. Zach, what do you got for me, buddy? Hey, so quick question. I'll keep it brief here. Mm -hmm. I've had the opportunity recently to uh, meet with some entrepreneurs who have shared that when they launched their companies, they had been employed as a cog, uh, but didn't leave um, their cog position until such time as their company became successful. Yeah. I'm about to launch my own company. I'm considering the same approach. I know you've talked about in the past in some of your past videos about how you know you had done some financial service for someone and he said, well, charge me for it and keep doing it yourself. I was yeah. wondering what your thoughts were on that particular approach. Um, I know, uh, well, I'll stop right there and you know, <laughs> let you share your thoughts there. So there's always a question of how do you get this new business off the ground, right? Which is what this really just boils down to. So effectively. Yeah. So one approach is you've got your day job and you're going to side hustle. <clears throat> like as a former employer, nothing irks me more than when I'm paying an employee to do something and they're not doing it because they're distracted doing some other shit, whether it's candy crush on some social app or they're just launching a business, which invariably creeps in on my time that I'm paying for. Now that I've gotten that out of the way, it is, it is a path that a lot of people choose to get their business off the ground because it's a side hustle. They have their weekends or evenings and they find ways to deal with stuff during the day while they're working. It's the safe way to do it. It's, it's the playing not to lose way to do it. Okay. Which works for a lot of people. The playing to win way is the way that I did it. I was forced into it. They gave me a package. They, they called me down. We were on the eighth floor of the building. The seventh floor was all the uh, VPs and the president's office and all that stuff. They called me down the seventh floor to the HR. You know, I see the HR chick's name on the phone. Yes, can you come down? We need to meet with you. Okay, what's this about? Haven't ever been called down there for fucking seven years. Go down there. They slide a big envelope across the table. They say, we're packaging you off. So I take a, a few thousand dollars and I go home and I'm like, what the hell am I going to do now? I got a mortgage. I'm, I'm, I'm screwed, basically. I look around. Am I going to go and work some, you know, for somebody else and do the exact same thing, probably for some different, different level of BS sort of thing? That's like, that's what I started contemplating. It's like, I have to pay for this roof. I have to make shit happen. It's kind of like when I got into that boxing match. Sure. I was I was mentally prepared for it. I had done the work. I said, you know what? I'm going to bring people there that are going to hold me accountable, including my girlfriend, because I can't lose to another man in front of my woman sort of thing, right? You have to win. I didn't have any other choice but to win. So that was a plain to win approach to getting my business off the ground. You can use either. They're both viable. They both come with advantages or, or disadvantages. But I can tell you this. There is no, like, if somebody came to me and said, hey, I have a business that I want you to invest money into. Can you give me $2 million for this new insert, whatever it happens to be? And I look at them and I say, okay, well, what are you doing right now? Like, how much time do you spend on this? You know, like, what is your strategy? Oh, well, you know, I've got a day job and I'm, this is my side hustle and I'm trying to get it off the ground. Not interested. 
not fucking interested at all because I know the guy that has a mortgage to pay, mouths to feed in his family and doesn't have a job is going to make it happen 10 times more than the guy that's still working his day job and launching it as a side hustle. You see what I'm saying? So to dovetail off that, absolutely. So to dovetail off that then, so it sounds like what you're referring to almost, if I'm not mistaken, is basically seeking an angel investor to start out with the company. And so this is a this is one option I am yet still considering. Um, mm -hmm. I have a strong desire, if possible, to maintain sole exclusive ownership of the company, uh, perhaps grow it to a point where it would potentially reach an IPO status at some point down the line. But suffice to say, it sounds like you are more, if I'm if I'm understanding what you're saying correctly, you are more in the line of find that angel investor and focus on that exclusively. Is that is that a correct assessment of what you're saying there? No, I don't like to borrow money for businesses. I've never borrowed money for businesses, for, for any business. And I've created three businesses that have done over a million dollars a year in annual sales. I've, I've launched more sure. than three. You know, obviously, you know, some of them don't don't work out. So I'm not a big fan of borrowed money for two reasons. One, it, it doesn't always work out. And two, you tend to lose control of the business because exactly. they tend to take a greater stake in the business than the value of the money they put into it. And they don't always add uh knowledge base to the business if you know what i'm saying they just want to put money into it and then walk away and then like what most angel investors will do is they'll just take 20 companies and they'll just throw 20 whatever you know 20 million dollars at 20 different companies you know million bucks each and one or two of them will just take off and be worth like eight or nine figures the rest of them just either skip along do nothing or they flop completely right so i talk about this in my course about borrowing money raising capital all that stuff Zach, the course is 1997. It is open until the end of the week. You're the you're the exact kind of candidate that's good to dive into this material and have access to the monthly Zoom call. So I'd encourage you to click the link in the description and grab a copy for yourself. Great, awesome. Thanks so much for your time. I really appreciate it. All right, Zach, take care, buddy. Um, let's see what Willem's got here. All right, Willem. Willem, what do you got for me, buddy? I would like to ask you, what is the easiest thing to sell online? It's the wrong question. It's like, it's like that wrong kid question. that asked uh, Andrew, what's the easiest way to get six pack apps, right? What is, what is the easiest thing to sell online? The easiest thing is what a lot of people want that there's no competition in. Mm -hmm. So my yeah. course, the school of entrepreneurship is not a this is the easiest thing to sell online. This is the easiest subscription revenue uh, business that you can sign up if you do A, B, C, and D sort of thing. It's not a follow these steps and make X amount of money course. It's a mindset course that shifts your mindset into a belief system that you adopt, which is going to make you lots of money easily because of the well, kind of business I... that you structure and you build. So if you have a question like, this is my business, this is my idea, we could talk about that, but if your question is, what's the easiest thing to sell online? I don't have an answer for you on that. Well, for example, I'm learning programming and uh, what would be sort of some sort of business tool that you would pay for that could make your life easier, for example? I would, I would go back to the three circles that I showed you guys earlier and I would ask you to ask yourself, what do I love doing? What am I really good at doing? And what am I love doing that I'm good at doing that also makes a shit ton, shit ton of money when you offer that service? Right. Like this is the mindset thinking. This is the shift that you need to make from what's the easiest thing to sell online to something like, OK, how do I find what I'm going to be good at making a lot of money that I love doing that also throws off lots of cash? Yes, I would maybe like to develop some sort of business software that could help uh, rich people and entrepreneurs make their business uh, easier. And maybe it would be some sort of, you know, um, do you have maybe like what, what do you think that businesses have generally problems with that could be automated with software for the biggest problems that business have yeah yeah for the biggest problems that businesses have is, is making money and growth they also have issues with employee retention they have issues with even even business mo like certain business models have problems that others don't for example like the things that i talk about in my courses well if you move a physical product like your question was what's the easiest thing to sell online so are you talking about uh, software or are you talking about like a physical product like uh, a watch probably or a ring? Both, but I would probably like to develop software because I listen to your podcast and you talk good. about information uh, products good. are easier to manage and sell. Exactly. Good. Okay. So I mean, you've been paying attention, right? So it's like, yes. you know, if you want to sell something online, you have the choice between, let's say, you know, this water bottle here, 
which is a viable product that people sell on Amazon FBA or eBay or wherever that you can get from Alibaba and get like a large container shipment of it. You find ways to market on like you can do all of that shit. Right. But then you have to find, you know, 30, 40 grand to get the first shipment over. Then you have to apply money to marketing. Then you have to store it. Then you have to ship it. Sometimes the shipping doesn't get it, get out there or it breaks. Or you can just put that down and say, I'm a coder. I like to code. I know how to code shit. You can make a mobile app. There's nothing to manufacture from China or ship to get it from you to me. You can just push a button on a computer and it travels through the internet. Right. So yes. you can structure like you can start from an advantageous position, a playing the win position by thinking outside of the box, not the conventional. Let me just move something on Amazon FBA, for example. This is what most people do, by the way. And create a they, digital and they product. Think they are entrepreneurs, <laughs> right? And you know, create a digital product, ideally with subscription revenue. So they're paying you monthly for access to it, right? Um, I have I have lots of services that I subscribe to. Well, I'm like, I use um, uh, mm -hmm. like Hype Fury is a good example. So Hype what, Fury what is, is an Hype Fury. Hype Fury, all one word. It, it, it's a it's a service that works with Twitter, and it automatically retweets uh, popular posts. It automatically at replies popular posts with pitches. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. if you follow me on Twitter and you see something gets like a thousand likes and then all of a sudden it says something below that. Did you like this tweet? You should check yes, out my yes, book. Yes. Did you like this tweet? You should check out my podcast. Did you like this tweet? You should check out my supplement line. Right. And then everybody that responds to that gets uh, gets those notifications. I'm very happy paying whatever I pay monthly for that. I don't even know what it is. Forty bucks or something like that. I'm very happy paying that monthly for that service to automate that aspect of my life on social media. So I don't have to do that shit. Right. Mm -hmm. So this guy figured that figured that pain point for many people and integrated something that they, people now subscribe to. I don't know how many subscribers he has, but if he's got a thousand people paying 40 bucks a month, he's doing very well. Right? Have you bought some sort of other software for your businesses in the past? What kind of software? You have you bought uh, any software in the past for your businesses? Of course, yeah. Like uh, probably accounting software, I'm guessing, or? No, I don't need to buy accounting software because it's uh, browser-based now. My accountant has the license. Uh, you know, he, he does what he needs to do. I can go to a browser, I can log in, I can see my EBITDA, I can see everything, right? So I don't need to buy that software, but the software still, you know, has a fee to the accounting firm. Depending on the access level that you want as the business, right? You can pay into it as well. But a lot of these are like, they're uh, recession proof, they're scandemic proof, they're needed all the time, right? Like if you're running a business and you have accounting issues, or if you need to account, you know, for whatever your taxes, your HST, any kind of taxes that you need to remit to the government, then you need an easy way to do that. And if you can, like, that's all that companies like FreshBooks were. I remember this guy uh, gave a talk at a learning event I was at 11, 12 years ago. And he was just getting FreshBooks off the ground. And, and FreshBooks is now one of the biggest accounting software uh, systems used here. I don't know if it's that popular around the world, but he was he was basically nobody. And now he's competing with QuickBooks, right? Like the biggest one out there. So mm -hmm. recurring revenue with software is always a good model. Are you currently spending any more money on software except that for Twitter? Uh, maybe some Loads. examples. Yeah, I don't. I've lost track of all the things that I subscribe to that I need, um, whether it's video Maybe editing thing, stuff, yeah. social media uh, stuff, accounting stuff, um, anything that anything that you can offer a, a business owner that automates and eases his life simply for a reasonable fee, people will buy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm mostly thinking of accounting software and uh, yeah, okay. Then I would then I would take a look at the top industries that run accounting software and see what chinks they have in the armor because they won't move fast enough to provide solutions to something like that. But a young startup guy like you can. Thank you. That's how most of them start. Like like QuickBooks was all CD based and you had to have the software on your computer. FreshBooks said, you don't need that. We'll do it browser based. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. So right. constantly innovating and making easier yeah. life easier for. I don't know. Is there a way to integrate into the blockchain that would make sense? I don't know. Uh, you know, I'm not an accountant. Like I'm not in that space. I just know that I have to have that shit done for the government. So I have. So I pay. Yeah. So they can confiscate more amount of your money. Yeah. Basically. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's how it works. Yeah.
You'll get it, yeah. <laughs> All right, man. Thank you. Thanks, buddy. See ya. All right. Um, let me quickly explain to you guys um, what's in the course, and then we'll wrap up the stream because I got to get ready for another call in about 20 minutes. Um, so, again, the link is in the description of the YouTube channel. If you're watching this on Twitter, Twitch, Facebook, anywhere, you can head over there. Uh, the School of Entrepreneurship is open for enrollment until May 6th. Um, if you just want to get into it, just hit the Enroll Now button, and boom, it should take you in to uh, the payment page. It, it didn't show you the other payment page, but it, but it opened on another window on my computer. You can read through all this stuff, um, you know, why I, I did it, how it solves a lot of the problems, who I am, what I've done, a lot of the events and you know accomplishments that I've achieved in my life. I've been to loads and loads of learning events. This is me with Kevin O'Leary here at Whistler. I don't know, this was probably about 11 or 12 years ago, no beard, still still hair on my head. Um, I spent a lot of money going to learning events, learning the, the, the best strategies and techniques to use in your business. Uh, Cameron Harold, I've had him on my channel, actually on the Plane to Win uh, podcast series. He was my business coach uh, for about two years in 2008. And I credit him to some of the hyper growth that I experienced in my own business at Total Debt Freedom. This is in the office space when he popped by from Vancouver to do a quick tour. Um, and, uh, you know, we spent some time together, obviously in real life, cause it's, it's better than doing it over the phone, uh, office culture. This is just a picture of, you know, me and my staff at the time, uh, where I went to go study basically Zappos, Aston Martin, I love rewards, tech for kids, one at Henry got junk G adventure tours in Toronto, Toronto social sport club. I, w I went to as many other offices as I could to see what systems they used in their business to solve problems that they had. So this is this is me over here on the left. Again, no facial hair uh, with my buddy Bill. Um, you know, we flew in together and took a limo over to 1-800-GOT-JUNK and Brian Scudamore gave us a tour of the office. Brian's a cool dude. He's, he's been running this business for decades now. Very, very profitable. Um, I've done speaking gigs, obviously. I've done loads and loads of marketing stuff. Uh, this is a picture of me here doing a radio ad uh, that I had out. And also we've, we've used television advertising, pay-per-click advertising. Right now, I don't use any advertising whatsoever. Um, all the money that I make is advertiser free. So there are ways that you can build a business without spending marketing dollars for conventional uh, half type of businesses where you need radio ads, TV ads, pay-per-click advertising. I've done it all. I know it works and I know what doesn't work. And all that stuff is in the course and in the course curriculum. You can go check out the course curriculum too. There's three... Uh, lectures or modules on mindset. I cover taxes, legal matters, insurance, the ideal kinds of businesses to run, how to develop a network, government and regulations and what you need to know about that and prepare for that because they will come and they will try to screw you if you do not structure yourself correctly. Why borrowing money is generally dumb. Human resources, what you need to know about that. Acquiring customers, building audiences and marketing what not to do in business. I'm a big fan of what not to do in life. It's why there's a chapter in my book on the 20 red flags. The 20 red flags is essentially, this is what you don't do if you want a peaceful life with women. This is this module here is what not to do in business if you want a productive, profitable, and fun business to run. Uh, I talk about pivoting because you will have to pivot. I had to pivot my debt business in 2011 when regulations and government came in and they tried to strangle the industry, which they almost successfully did to completeness uh, we found a way to pivot in the legislation that allowed us to continue. Most businesses weren't smart enough to figure that out. So I talk extensively in this lecture about pivoting, what we had to do to pivot, how we pivoted, all that stuff. Generating business ideas. Uh, then the last closing uh, lecture is on the Zoom calls, how they work, how to use the Facebook discussion, so on and so forth. Then I keep adding bonus lectures. So this is where stuff just keeps getting better and better for the older, more seasoned, tenured members that signed up last year because they paid a lot less last year than what people are paying today because I keep adding stuff. Lessons from a thousand self-published books. This 44-minute lecture, I have a guy uh, who's in my business forum that has published over a thousand books on Amazon. That's all he does is he publishes books in sequence um, in a specific uh, genre, if I can put it that way. You can watch the lecture if you get into the school. Lessons from Amazon FBA, um, a guy that spent a lot of time moving physical products on Amazon. There's a 41 minute webinar with him. There's a three part webinar that I put in after the fact, because people were asking a lot of the times about YouTube. So I did three videos 
One is 40 minutes, one is 30, and the Q&A segment is 25 minutes. It's a three-part series on how I built YouTube and, and how I see the platform working and how you can capitalize it for on it for your own business. I had a guy on, on uh, software as a service freelancing and Android development. had a guy on, on crypto, blockchain, NFTs, and gaming. And I also did an additional lecture on incentives to keep employees glued to your business if you're the guy that has employees. There's another one coming out at the end of this month, which hasn't been added yet, which you'll have access to, which is on lowering your tax burden and acquiring passports for diversification. Because some places in the world, like where I live, you can pay up to 56% of your income in taxes. It's actually more than that when you factor in everything that piles on top of that after you've paid taxes on your income. But there's places in the world where you can pay zero taxes. So I've got a guy on for a webinar on that. Anyway, I can keep going. <clears throat> my my voice is slowly losing me. Um, I would invite you guys to check out the link and get in. Uh, the enrollment period, again, it, it expires in four days. Uh, the course closes in four days, 11 hours and 48 minutes, according to this update over here. So um, you get the idea. It, it's Look, if you're serious about making real money, um, those people that said, you know, I'd like to make way more money than what I'm making right now, uh, if you're monthly way more money amount happens to be $25,000, which is what people said again. This is the path to it. I'm, I'm going to tell you right now, it's not easy. Most people will fail. Most people will do nothing with it. But if anything, the course material will set your, will, will square you away in the sense where if you're going to do it, you're best prepared and better prepared for a level of success. And if you're currently running a business, I promise there's going to be a nugget in there somewhere that you're going to be able to use, right? Whether it's at a pivot, something to do with uh, employee, employee retention, any issues you have. And you've also got access to me for three hours monthly of Zoom calls as well, which I do continuously into perpetuity. I have no intention of stopping that because people are always asking me about entrepreneurship because of the channel title and what I've doing, where I've come from. I'm that guy. All right. So check that out. I hope you guys enjoy it. Um, that is pinned in the top description of the video. Playing to win versus playing not to lose. You guys, leave your comments below. You let me know.